We're going to be looking um, Second Timothy. You want to put your finger there, and then Hebrews. Um, as you know, we started a new summer series. Uh, we do like to go through books of the Bible here. We just wrapped up uh, this past year, year and a half, the book of Genesis, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. First and Second Peter was our last service, our last series that led us to the summer. And then in the fall, I don't know about some of your community groups, but in our community group, we're reading through the book of Acts twice between, well, some people in our community group, some people that, I don't know, yeah, uh, reading through the book twice before the series gets started in September. So we're going to look at a very close look at uh, the book of Acts, uh, the Acts of, not the Apostles, I know it says that in your Bible, but somebody wrote that in there. It's really the Acts of the Holy Spirit on how the Spirit of God was descended on the people of God, and they were on mission with Jesus. You see, you know, the work of the, of the Holy Spirit uh, gathering and, 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 and uh, using the apostles and the disciples to declare the gospel. So we'll look at that pretty uh, intensely as we start in September. But meantime, we are in a series called Because You Asked. What we did is send out, um, uh, we asked the congregation to send us some questions. We received a whole bunch of questions, uh, April, March, April, May formulated eight questions, and that, were, that is what we're going to be doing today, okay? Let's pray if we can one more time. Father, your word is a lamp unto our feet. What you have said and declared will, will come to pass because you are God. From everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. So, Father, as we open your word, um, in this particular subject and topic, Father, um, I, I'm thankful that your spirit knows the hearts of every man, woman, and child. So, God, we ask that you would... Um, just do what's necessary that we respond, whether, it, whether it's a, a, a conviction of our sin and the need to turn to Jesus or a settlement in our hearts that uh, he has uh, saved us from our sins. So whatever it may be, Lord, we pray that you would get glory, we would get joy, and together as your people, uh, we would respond in worship and adoration of the one true and living God. And we ask all this in the, in the precious, matchless name of Jesus. Amen. So, so far we've asked, we've uh, answered four questions. Just let me throw them at you. They're online. You can podcast, download, watch the video, whatever you want. Uh, the first question was, what is, what is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? What does it mean to blasphemy in the Holy Spirit? And what is the sin that leads to death? Okay? So there's some things in our walk, you know, you know I don't, I don't want to go to hell. So what does that actually mean? I want to avoid those things. Uh, that was the first question. The second question is, what does it mean to trust in God? We looked at Proverbs 3. What does it really mean to Trust in God. The third question was, what's, what's up with suffering? We looked at the suffering and the sovereignty of God. Uh, these questions were th- thrown at this, the pastoral staff during the study of First and Second Peter that had to do with suffering of the church. So somebody threw in there, you know, what does it mean? So we looked at Job 1 and 2, and we looked at the sovereignty of God and the suffering of man. Nathan, Pastor Nathan did a great job last week, talked about uh, tithing. Someone said, what is, it, what, is the, what is the deal with New Testament tithing? What does that look like? So that was last week. This week, question number five came in uh, to the staff as uh, more of a negative than a positive. The question was, can someone explain to me Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6? Hebrews chapter 6, chapter six verses 4 through 6. The real question behind that question was, uh, can, someone, can, can someone lose his or her salvation? Can someone come to a genuine faith and then fall away from the faith both fully and finally. It's a doctrine of eternal security. It's also known under the heading of the, the perseverance of the saints. The perseverance of the saints. Many people, including myself, really don't like perseverance of the saints. And, and, and a lot of times you'll see it as the, the preservation of the saints. Because the perseverance of the saints make it sound like it's a two-handed salvation. That as long as God has me and I have God... We persevere together, and then, e- then my eternal security and the fact that I will el- enter into heaven when I die is a two-handed salvation. That is why we, when we talk about the preservation of the saints, uh, it sounds better than the perseverance of the saints because it makes it sound like, um, you know, we're holding on. And the real question, and by the way, that's horrifying to me, and I'll explain to you, in a few moments. So the real question is, once someone is genuinely saved, trusted in the work and the merit of Christ's death on the cross, dying for our sins, rising from the dead, and that's, that has been you know, given to me and my salvation, can I then lose my salvation? Can I then one day wake up and not be a Christian? That's the question. 
That's the question. And there are two camps, I will tell you right up front. And we'll talk about more of this in a couple weeks when I deal with election and predestination. The one camp is the Wesleyan-Arminian camp, taken from guys like John Wesley and, and James Arminius. They teach that, that there can be a genuine conversion to Christ, a salvation, and then as time goes on, uh, people can actually lose and, and fall away and go to hell. That's what they teach. And they use Hebrews 6 as one of their key texts to teach that. So we're going to look at that in a a few minutes. The second camp is what is called the Reformed camp. All right? And uh, the Reformed camp is guys like the Reformers, like John Calvin, um, John MacArthur, John Knox, a lot of Johns, John Piper uh, in this camp. And they teach that salvation is, is the work of God, and a genuine Christian will never lose their salvation. It is God who first perseveres with us, and, and, and with us, and, and we persevere, we don't fall away. Otherwise, if it was not God holding us, we would crash and burn. And because he perseveres, we also persevere. And, and what they would say is that perseverance then becomes for us a, 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 a sign of the ultimate proof of our salvation. So those who are finally and fully saved is proof that they were genuine Christians. That's what they would say. So let me tell you what camp I'm in. I'm in the Bible, which means I'm in the Reformed camp, okay? I'll tell you that right now. (laughs) The Scripture is clear, clear, and I'm going to try to convince everyone in this room that there is no way we can lose our salvation because the Bible tells that we are protected by the omnipotent power of God through faith, and this faith brings us into... This faith brings us into a grace relationship with God as a gift through the merit and work of his son. We can't earn it. It's not our record. Therefore, we can't unearn it. And it's not according to our record. I cannot imagine waking up every day and thinking this might be the day. Bottom line, Jonah said it very succinctly in chapter 2, verse 9 of Jonah. Salvation belongs to the Lord. We studied 1 Peter together in his suffering church spread throughout uh, Asia Minor. He opens up 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to His great mercy. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Two, that's for us, an inheritance, that's eternal life, that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's omnipotent power are being guarded, protected, kept, guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. All right, that settles it, but I'm going to preach anyway because you're here. <laughs> Let me just say two quick things. Nothing's ever quick. I know what you're thinking. Number one, the problem, well, the... the, the I won't say the problem. The issue that I face preaching this message is I don't want to give anybody a false sense of security. Okay? I don't want to give anybody a false sense of security. In no way, shape, or form am I trying to say to those who are playing Christianity, whether you go to church, your family's a Christian, you say all the right things, even involved in Christian work, that have no change of heart, no rebirth, no regeneration, no awakening of, the, uh, of your life to the gospel, response to the gospel, that you're resting in the eternal security of God's omnipotent power. If you're here today and you have not settled it in your life and you're just playing, this is, I don't want to give you a false sense of security. You need to repent and turn to Jesus, relying completely on him for your salvation. You're a sinner, I'm a sinner. Hell awaits us if not for the saving power and work of Jesus. Turn to him wholeheartedly and he will give you the gift of the Holy Spirit. So I don't want to give false security, but I don't want to stop preaching the Bible either. We'll end with that. We'll go back to that. So I want to be really careful that, um, that you, know, you, you, you don't rest in a false security. Peter wrote, again, in Second Peter, Whoever lacks these qualities, says virtue, knowledge, he's talking about things that we add to our faith, godliness, self-control. He said those who lack these qualities are nearsighted. He's blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent. Brothers, be diligent to confirm, to make sure your calling and your election, that's your salvation, 
For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. In other words, it's not the work of Jesus, not the qualities, it's not the, the, the fruit of the Spirit in your life that saves you, but it assures you that Jesus is in you, and if he is in you, then you can be sure of your salvation. See how that works? So as we grow in our faith and, and, and grow uh, in, in our lives, we experience the assurance of our faith subjectively for what Christ has already done objectively. So Christ dies on the cross for our sins, rises from the grave. We trust in him objectively. We are secure, but experientially takes time. As we see our lives change, as we see our hearts change, we know that God is working in our lives. I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with people saying, you know, I'm not really sure, I'm not really sure. And I would say, and I see the change in their life. I'm like, you, you used to do this. Oh, yeah, I'm, you know, that, that, that bothers me now. And, and this has changed, and that has changed. Your life is being changed. Let that be not what you're secure in, but your assurance that God has saved you. Okay? So if you're not sure, maybe it's because you're just playing Christianity. Again, repent and trust in the finished work of Christ. So I don't want to give a false sense of, of, of hope, but I, I don't want to walk away and, and not teach the Bible. Second, the doctrine of eternal security and the preservation of the saints is really important to me. It's really important to me, just so you know, okay? It's not on the same level as the atonement of Christ, the authority of the Scripture, you know, the virgin birth, but it's also not on the level of, like, what's your eschatology? You know, are you amil, pre-mil? Uh, do you, you know, do you believe, what, is it, what do you believe about speaking in tongues? You know, it's not, it's not, that's important, but not, you know, we could talk about that. It's not a big deal. But eternal security and the preservation of the saints is very important to me. And, and, and the reason it is, because the real question is not, can I lose my salvation? But can God lose someone he saves? To believe that one can lose that which God has done, promised, and will promise to see to the completion is an assault on the character and the nature of God. So to that, I take some serious, you know, it's extremely important to me. Okay, so I don't want to give false sense of hope. I want to see our experiences, not resting in our experiences, but will give us the assurance that, you know, God is working in my life. I can rest on him alone. And also, what are you saying about the character and the nature of God? Okay? Turn to 2 Timothy. What I want to do just in the next uh, 20 minutes or so, and then we'll jump into Hebrews, and then we'll finish up. Um, what I want to do is I want to show you this morning that our eternal security is the work of the triune God. Is the work of the trying you, God, Father, Son, and Spirit. So we're just going to walk through that quickly, and let's see what we got. Okay. The Father's ability, thank you, to keep the, even I'm cold. The Father's ability to keep us eternally secure. Okay? Chapter, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 6. For this, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you. Paul writing to uh, Timothy. It's his last penned letter. He will be martyred after this. Not really sure about his future. Not really sure of when he was going to die. Not really sure how he's going to die or who, at whose hands. But one thing he's sure about, and that's the promises of God. Verse 6, again. I want to remind you to fan into, fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power... Holy Spirit, power, love, and self-control. Therefore, he tells Timothy, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. Okay, I'm locked up, but that's okay. But let's share in the suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who's sustaining of God. Verse 9, who God saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. Before the ages began. First notice, the Father's plan persuades us of our eternal security. Verse 9. Look at that quickly here. God called us with a holy calling. Two Greek words uh, pointing to something very specific. It's a holy calling. Not just a calling, but a holy calling. We're not talking about a general call. We're not talking about a broad sweeping call. We're an outward invitation of the gospel to everyone. What he's talking about is a holy calling. 
It is the, that call of God that creates life. It's the call of God that renews and regenerates the heart. That's why it's, sometimes it's called an effectual call or, or an if, um, efficacious call, the effectual call. The word holy is the word hagios, separated and, and set apart. For the people of God, when they, call, when they say that we are, we are sanctified or we set apart or we are holy, it means that we are set apart from sin, set apart from sin and set apart to God, devoted to God, from something to something, from sin to God. That's what holy means. Calling is the word that is used of an invitation, a regular calling, an invitation, kaleho or kalesis. It's called as being invited. When you put those two together, it expresses the means and the purpose of God's call. Now, if you look, according to this verse, God does the calling for our salvation for what? His own purpose and his own grace. And that call prompted, look at the verse, not by deeds, not by works, not by anything you did, but by God's good pleasure, God's grace, before the, what, the world began. 1 Corinthians 1.8 says, It's God who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of Jesus Christ our Lord, Verse 9 of chapter 1 of Corinthians, it says, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So God is faithful. God will sustain you. The gift of, the, of our calling is the work of God that cannot be earned and therefore it cannot be forfeited. And when you and I came, if you're a Christian here and you've been uh, born into the family and you are part of his family, that day, that time, that place in history... Um, where, where you, you know, uh, said yes to Jesus uh, was not due to anything you, by your own power and purposes or work of your own. It is purely the work of God. And some people object, and if you're here and you're objecting, well, that makes us a robot, I would say absolutely not. The Bible is crystal clear about uh, uh, the decisions, the real responsive decisions and choices that are real choices and decisions that we make. The call of God, I want you to catch this, the call of God doesn't violate our will like robots. The call of God does not violate our will. It liberates our will. The call of God doesn't violate like a robot our will. It frees us, it liberates us to see Christ and his glory and our need for salvation. So, that day came, we made real choice to follow Jesus, to repent of our sins. To, but my, my friends, listen, it's not the part, or it's not part of the work of our salvation, it's the result of our salvation. Real choice, real decision, the result of what God has already done, which reminds me of a story. Taxi driver and his preacher die, they both go to heaven. Preacher, excuse me, the taxi driver gets there ahead of time, and when the preacher gets there, he looks and he sees this taxi driver got a Beautiful robe, gold scepter, uh, a, a mansion. Wow, the preacher thought. That's pretty good. He goes up. St. Peter gives him a wooden stick, burlap bag, and a, and, and a small little shack. He says, St. Peter. Uh, uh, he says, son, listen, preacher. It all has to do with results. It all has to do with the results. You see, when, when, when you were down on earth, when you preached, everyone slept. When he drove the taxi, everyone prayed. <laughs> Our real response to the gospel was the result of the awakening, renewal, call, and invitation by God to the gospel. The Father's plan persuades us of our eternal security and sustains us, he says, to the end. The Father's promise also guarantees our eternal security. 1 John 5 I don't have that up there. 1 John 5, listen to this. And this is the testimony that God, the Father, gave us eternal life. Life is what? In his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. I write these things to you, John is writing the apostle, who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Notice the Aris text in verse 11. God has God gave us eternal life. It's a historical fact that took place. Verse 12 of 1 John 5, present tense. Whoever has the Son has life, has given. That tense means that it is something that is a one-time given, and it's a continuation forever. Right? So I don't know what your definition of God has given us, one time lasts forever, that's eternal. 
life. I mean, the, the word eternal is the word high Oneos, Hyonios, it has to do with not only the, the duration, but the permanency, the, the unchangingness. God is said to give us eternal, unchanging, forever, uh, permanent life. That's what he says. Was, uh, an elderly lady was, was um, no, not here, but there was an elderly woman that was, that was passing away, and somebody went to go visit her in the hospital. And um, she wasn't a Christian, the one that went to visit her, but the elderly lady was saint was. And she was, she was talking about heaven. She was talking about Jesus. She was talking about seeing him. And, and, and this woman thought it was a little bit presumptuous, you know, um, that she was so secure. And this child of God turned to her and said, you know, if I don't make it to heaven, God will lose more than I do. The woman said, hmm, I don't understand. She said, if I perish, I will lose my salvation, but God will lose his honor. He, for he promised to give eternal life to all who come to him through his son, Jesus Christ. Now, you know that's not going to happen. Folks, our salvation is not on our reputation or even your strength, but God's promise. It's his character. It's in his nature. Romans eleven twenty nine. 29. The gifts and the calling of God, that's the effectual renewal calling, are irrevocable. I mean, permanent, unchanging. The difference is this. When I, my kids were little, we would take walks in the park or wherever we would go, and I would hold them hand. They think they would hold on to me, but I'm holding them. And you know what? They would fall. And they may even scrape a knee. But I'm not letting go. But I'm not letting go. The Father has the ability to keep us eternally secure. Look at his son, John 5, 24. Jesus talking. Truly I say to you, whoever hears my word... Jesus talking, believes in him who sent me, has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. John 10, my sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Now, the word never perish is, is the Son of God's promise, guarantee of our eternal security. It is actually in the double negative. So, in other words, you could say... Um, my sheep hear my voice. I give them eternal life. They will never, no, never, never perish. Charles Spurgeon, Baptist preacher. It is a sweet thought to me that even Satan himself could never rob me of my pardon. I may lose my copy of it, lose my comfort from it, but the original pardon is filed in heaven. Jesus' promise guarantees our salvation. It can't change. But also the Son's protection reassures us of our eternal security. No one can snatch you out of his hand. He says the same thing about his father if you keep reading that verse. Some people look and they will say, well, nobody can snatch us out of our hand, but I can jump out. Well, are you stronger and mightier and more omnipotent than God? I don't think so. What happens to our sins when we become a Christian? As Christians, our sins are forgiven by the wrath-absorbing sacrifice of Jesus. How much of our sins? All, past, present, and future. So what would happen if we lose our salvation as a Christian? All of a sudden, God's going to count our sins against us, right? We were once justified, made right by the Son. Now, all of a sudden, we're an, we're an, we're an enemy of God again, right? We are adopted into the family and then given the boot out of the family of God. There's a pastor and, and an evangelist from England, F.B. Meyer, wrote about uh, the two German men who wanted to climb uh, Matterhorn, Maybe Bill has been in a Matterhorn yet? No? All right. Next time. A mountain in the Alps. It's a border between, it's, it's a mountain that's in, uh, um, between Switzerland and Italy. Anyway, so these, these two men wanted to climb, and they got three, gar, um, three um, guides to take them up this mountain. And what they did was they roped together. So you had a guide, the traveler, the German traveler, a guide, the traveler, and then the guide. And they went up, but they didn't get very far, and they began to slip. And... Um, one of the men, the fourth guy, actually slipped from his hold. Well, although everybody else had him quite secure, they each started losing their hold, and, and, and four out of the five men were dangling. Um, but the one, the first guy that was first, w was firm because he had uh, uh, driven a stake deep into the ice. And because he held to the ground, all the other men that were connected to him regained their footing, climbed back up, and were able to survive the trip. And F.B. Meyer concludes the story drawing a spiritual analogy. He says, I am like the one of those men who slipped, but thank God 
I am bound in a living partnership to Christ. And because he stands, I will never perish. That's a picture of the eternal security of the Son. Jesus is our rock. He is our stronghold. It is not our feeble hold on Christ that keeps us eternally secure, but his firm grip on us that keeps us eternally secure. John 6, I say to you, you have seen me, and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will who sent me. I should lose nothing of all that he has given to me, but raise it up on the last day. The Holy Spirit. His permanent presence. Listen, guarantees. John 6, 14, 16. I will ask the Father, Jesus talking, and he will give you another helper. That's the Holy Spirit. Who will be with you how long? Now, I'm not the sharpest pencil in the bunch. But if God is going to give me the Holy Spirit for trusting in Christ forever, and I was able to be cast into the abyss in eternal hell, that would make the Holy Spirit present in hell with me. I don't think so. 2 Corinthians 1.20 For the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us. Who has also put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Ephesians 1.13, in him, you also, you heard the word of truth, the gospel of what? Your salvation. You believed in him. You were what? Sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until when? We acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Last verse. Chapter 4, verse 30. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, whom you've been sealed for the day of redemption. Now, our mark and seal, the, the seal in Jesus' day, what, did at least two things. One, it, it was affixed to a document that it would guarantee that it was, it was genuine. Uh, so people would use it to, um, uh, like a signia, to place their, their own signia on it, saying, you know, the king would do it with a document, making sure that it wasn't open, that it was sealed, like we seal food. So it would be genuineness and its guarantee. The Holy Spirit writes for us that his seal on us is a way authenticating the work of God. Guaranteeing the, the genuineness of our salvation. Sealed. Paul also adds that the Holy Spirit was given as a deposit. Or, or, the, or and if you have an ESV, it's, it's a guarantee. The word guarantee, that's a great word. It comes from the, from the commerce uh, world. It was a token payment assuring the vendor that the full payment would come soon. I'm giving you a down payment because what I'm going to give you will be the full payment. Now, in today's day, we're like, well, that, you know, I'm not, you know, either pay it all or don't pay it all. You know what I mean? I mean, you ain't getting it. Because we can't, maybe there's some tr untrustworthiness going on. Don't think that way when you see the deposit and the guarantee of God because it is not man who lays this deposit down. It is the work of God. The one who makes the deposit may not be trustworthy in your life, but not so with God. He gives us the Holy Spirit guaranteeing our inheritance until when? Sealed guarantee until we acquire, until we're in glory, until we're in the new heavens and a new earth, until our full redemption. That's the work of the Spirit of God. So hopefully I've convinced you. Now we can go to Hebrews 6. We won't spend much time there, but turn to Hebrews 6. You tracking with me? All right. Hebrews 6. Do I have it? Yeah, I think I do. Okay. Now. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit, verse 5, and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then fall away to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. Let me just tell you there's a couple interpretations. I'll, I'll go, I'm going to stick with one. I just want to give you a couple just quickly. 
Number one, there are those who believe that this passage is speaking about a, a communal. That, that the Hebrew writer is talking about the community, has the community, the covenant community in mind, not the individual salvation. And, and what they say is that this passage leads very heavy on the Old Testament covenant people and all the warnings that they were giving in, in the wilderness. And that Hebrews is following that theme and, and not telling anyone particularly, but telling the whole community, the New Testament covenant community, that they need to be warned. There was a warning that not everybody is a believer, as it was in the Old Testament covenant, that not everybody was a believer, but that he is speaking in that general sense. Okay? Does that make sense? One writer put it this way. When we read of the falling away of God's, excuse me, when we read of the falling away and of God's subsequent rejection, it is a rejection of a community that is in focus. Community. Such a rejection does not necessarily include every individual member of the community. In both the Old Testament and New Testament parallel passages like this, the same thing can be seen here. The problem with that interpretation is there is some parallels between the Old Testament covenant people and the New Testament covenant people, but people take it way too far. I think he does. So I would reject that. I would say Hebrews is talking about individual salvation. It's not Old Testament covenant people. It's the New Testament covenant people that are, that are, that are, that are born again children of God. So I, I wouldn't say that would be the correct interpretation. Second interpretation of this passage is it's hypothetical. It's a hypothetical situation. They say, listen, they're genuine Christians who love the Lord, who, who, who have been regenerated, they, they're adopted into the family, they've been justified, and the writer is trying to scare them. It's trying to, to awaken them from their moral sluggishness of what could possibly happen if they could fall away, but really they won't. And they point to verse 9. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things for you. So, you know, we're saying this, but this is not really what's going to happen, the hypothetical view. I, I think that has some merit, but I, I don't necessarily agree with that one. The third view is the description of Hebrews 4, of what some of the Arminian and some of the Wesleyan folks say, that they were once regenerated, born again, children of God. They have now fallen away, they've tasted, they've been enlightened, and they can never come back to repentance. That they were genuine Christians and they lost their salvation. And if you notice, if that's the case, then they could never be restored. So you have one shot. Don't blow it. Because if you are saved, then you're unsaved. You're done. That, that's what that would teach. That would violate all the scripture I read to you today. So I don't believe that one either, obviously. So what does it say? Let's look at it a little bit here. Okay? Let's look at it a little bit here. You know, it, it's interesting because if, if you believe that, you know, again, you've been kicked out of the family. The power and, and the, the keptness of God has failed. Eternal life becomes a few years because you've not justified anymore, right? You stop. And the thing, not to get sidetracked here, but just one last thing. I don't want to get too hot. Here we can open some windows. Um, when you get saved, the Bible says in, in Ephesians, for by grace you've been saved through faith, Right? This, this is not, you know, not your own doing. It's the gift of God. So when you become a Christian, you step out of the, the realm of, I got to obey the law to be righteous because you never do, into grace. What's grace? Unmerited, you know, unconditional favor, the love of God poured out on us, something we don't earn, something we can't get on our own merit, right? It's unearned, unmerited favor of God. So if, if, if being saved is through faith and grace and then you stop receiving grace, how can you get out of grace? I mean, if there's a way out of grace, it would no longer be grace. I mean, think about that. If grace is God's love, mercy, and forgiveness freely given to us by no merit of our own, and then we're removed from the realm of grace by something we did, it wasn't grace after all. Grace is unearned, unmerited favor of God. It's not realm of grace, realm of law, realm of grace. Grace is grace. It's not yours. It was given to you freely. All right. Hebrews 6, verse 4. Let me just, let me just break this down to you uh, in a few moments here. Notice in verse 4, he says, those who have been enlightened. See what it says? It doesn't say those who have repented and believed. It says enlightened. In fact, you don't see any words in this text about regeneration, justification, being in Christ, being adopted, words we use for our salvation. The word enlightened means to understand. 
right? It, it, it's to learn, it's to understand. And although uh, intellectual understanding is part of our salvation, uh, work of God in our salvation, it's not enough. A lot of people understand. Verse 4 it says that the word, uh, the word tasted the heavenly gift. Now the word tasted could mean something that you have uh, experienced in a deep way. And, and guys who think you can lose your salvation point to the fact that in Hebrews chapter 2, it says that Jesus tasted death for everyone. So it's not just, you know, not that he just tasted it in the sense of just on the lips, but he experienced it, and that's what it means here. Well, maybe, but I don't think so. Because, because in Matthew chapter 27, verse 34, Jesus is hanging on the cross, and the soldiers get a wine and sour the, uh, a drink, and they give it to him to drink, and what does he do? He tastes it, it says, and he refused to drink it. So tasting could mean also just wet in my lips, not necessarily experiencing it. Even the word partakers is NAS, and I think uh, we have shared in the ESV. Uh, met, metacos, metacos, union with Christ. It could mean a loose association. It doesn't mean necessarily union of being born again, having that special union with Christ. It could, but it's the same word that's used when Peter got this boatload of fish and he calls all his friends over to help him with the fish. They were partakers. They were sharers of that. Listen, they may, have, they may have helped. They may have even impacted his life. But let me tell you, it didn't change Peter. So there's a loose association. Even the Holy Spirit. It's talking about sharing in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has multiple roles. The role of judging, the role of judgment, the role of righteousness. Yes, the role of regenerating, handing out gifts. So it's hard to say what does it really mean sharing the Holy Spirit? Could it be something that's just, again, like being tasting? It's, it's being influenced. And it seems to me in this verse, according to the rest of Scripture, there's a whole lot of sharing and tasting going on, but no one seems to be indwelled. No one seems to be possession of. No one seems to be born again, justified, adopted into the family of God. Even repentance in this verse, people say, well, well how do you repent again? Well, let me tell you something. Repentance can lead to life when you repent from your sin and turn to Jesus. But if you repent because you got caught, it's a, it's a road to death. So repentance, turning from your sin is good, but if it's not a turning to God, it's not going to help you a whole lot eternally. Judas repented. He's a son of perdition and hung himself. Okay? So I think our text here in Hebrews 6 is what's happened then and in our churches today. There are people who are receiving knowledge of the word, sharing in some of the benefits of the covenant community, experiencing some degree the work and the power of the Holy Spirit, but they're still on the outside looking in. That's what, Peter, that's what the writer, uh, they have not, that's what the writer of uh, Hebrews is saying. They have not been truly repented of the sins and given a new heart. F.F. Bruce says, in these verses, the author is not questioning the perseverance of the saints. We might say that rather he is insisting that those who persevere are the true saints. But in fact, he is stating a practical truth that has been verified repeatedly in experience of the church. Those who have shared the covenant privileges of the people of God and then deliberately renounced them are the most difficult persons of all to reclaim for the faith. I hope none of you are there. So I don't think the genuine, and, and just look at verse 7 with me, because there's more in the context, right? Look at verse 7. For the land, now he's talking about what he just said, for the land, he's explaining it, for the land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from God, but... If it bears thorns and thistles, what? It is worthless and near to being cursed, and its end is to be burned. What's he saying? Rain falls on all kinds of ground, but the ground alone, you cannot tell what kind of vegetation, if any, will appear. What the writer is picturing for us is not a ground that receives frequent rain, yields fruit, and then loses it. The picture is two kinds of grounds altogether. And according to the metaphor, the same events, the rain, the, the enlightenment, the, the tasting, the, the uh, sharing, that's, that's, the, that's, the, um, that's the event, is coming on the ground, and, and the different kinds of, of things are being sprung up. In other words, people hear the gospel and respond with genuine faith, it will produce life. Yet the same events, the rain, the enlightenment, will produce 
Thorns and thistles, death. So I think that kind of explains exactly what he's talking about. Wayne Grudem writes, we should notice here that people who commit apostasy are never compared to a field that once bore good fruit and now does not. But that they are like land that never bore good fruit but only thorns and thistles. The land may look good before the crops start to come up, but the fruit gives the genuine evidence and it is bad. Even verse 9, look at verse 9. Do I have 9 up there? Yeah. Though we speak this way, yet in your case, we feel sure of better things. Things that belong to salvation. So what's he doing? He's turning his attention to those who, in verses 4 through 6, who aren't Christians, to those who are genuine Christians. He's convinced there are better things for you. Not partial blessing and temporary influences, but he expects uh, that there will be things that will be produced that are according to your salvation, belonging to your salvation. If the author meant to be the same people, he wouldn't have turned and saying, all right, these are those unsaved people really just dancing around the gospel, and you are really, truly, genuinely Christians, and therefore you're producing a crop. You're, you're, you're producing things that belong to your salvation. Not just tasting, not just enlightenment, but there's evidence of your salvation. You're not dancing around evidence. And what's the evidence? Verse 10. For God is not just to overlook your work and the love, your work, your love, that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you do. You're servants of the saints. You're working in love. We desire each of you to show the same earnestness to have the full what? Assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitated of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So real salvation will be real fruit, verse 10, in their lives. Assurance, verse 11. And saving faith is exhibited by inheriting the promise in verse 12. Some may ask, I hear it all the time, well, I know so-and-so, and they had such a powerful testimony. And I know so-and-so, and they went overseas to a trip uh, uh, serving the Lord. And now they're, you know, they're pagans and devil worshipers. They just turned completely to the side. What happened? Number one, sin, Christian sin. Christians get trapped in sin. Okay? That's why, that's why people backslide. That's not different than, than losing your salvation. Paul wrote to Galatia, brothers, if anyone's caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual, restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Watch yourself lest you be tempted. So it could be a backslidden condition. They're not going to worship Satan, but they're, they're going to live a life that is, that is humbly broken. Like They're like, no, I knew a brother that backslid for years when I first went to the facility where I used to work. And he knew every day he was backslidden. It wasn't like he put off everything. He was living in sin, and he knew it. That's the difference. Number two, what about those people? First John 2, they went out from us. They were, they, they, they were with us. They looked like us, First John tells us, but they went out from us. If they had been with us, they would have continued, but they went out to show that they were never one of us. So people can say all kinds of things, share testimonies, get up here and preach and not be a Christian. I know a man who got saved after he got his MDiv, Master of Divinity, and was in a church, got saved by preaching his own message. How's that? True story. (laughs) Hebrews chapter 3. Just turn there real quick. Hebrews chapter 3. Listen to what it says. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 14. For we have come to share in Christ. If indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. Underline that. If you're concerned about Hebrews 6, underline chapter 3 verse 14. Notice he doesn't say if you hold your confidence to the end, you will then share in Christ. He says, we know that we have had sharing from the beginning our life with Christ, sharing with Christ, because we endured to the end. Which means perseverance in faith is the evidence that we have been made sharers of Christ, not the other way around. Assurance is not automatic, as I said. It's rooted in our confidence in the all-powerful, sovereign, covenant-keeping God who sent His Son on our behalf Dying, atoning death, rising from the dead. And as we look to him, we continue to look to him. The Holy Spirit testifies with our spirit that we belong to him. There's a difference. Perseverance is evidence of your eternal security. So three things we can walk away as we close. Just, I just want to give you three practical things. Number one, if you believe this and honestly believe this and trust in the Bible and take it seriously and, and honestly 
um, correctly with, with good biblical teaching, number one, you'll have a humble life. When you realize that it's the work of Christ on our eternal security depends on, totally on Jesus, we did nothing to earn it, we, didn't, we can't lose it, it should humble you and exalt Jesus. Packer wrote, humility and passion for praise are a pair of characteristics which together indicate growth in grace. The healthy heart is one that bows down in humility and rises in praise and adoration. There's a humility, a brokenness, and there's a worship and confidence in. You'll, have, you'll be humbled, right? Humility, pro, uh, uh, confidence that's properly placed on Jesus. The deeper you become in Scripture and grow in the grace and knowledge of a Christ, is the recognition that God has chosen us by free grace, accounted to us the righteousness of Christ on our behalf, and you will sing and praise and worship God for it. Okay? If you're a proud and arrogant idiot, you don't understand. So you would have a humble life. Secondly, it'll be hopeful life. Hebrews 6, we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to be full assurance of hope until the end. Hebrews 5, excuse me, Romans 5, we've been justified by faith. We have peace with God through Jesus Christ. We've gained access into the faith by grace in which we stand. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Biblical hope is biblical hope in the future. The hope we have is future because God has made a promise to us. Can you imagine if your eternal security and salvation that you will make it to the end is contingent on you? Me? Oh, my word. It'd be about like two seconds. I'm saved, I'm unsaved. I'm saved, I'm unsaved. It would be crazy. This man walked up to this little kid in a baseball field. And he said, hey, young man, uh, you know, what's the score? And the little kid said, 18 to nothing, and we're behind. 18 to nothing, and we're behind. And the man said to the little guy, I bet you must be very discouraged. He said, why should I be discouraged? We haven't gotten up yet. So, you know, he was confident. <laughs> Right? Biblical hope rests in the character of God, in the character and the promises of God. Paul, a servant of Jesus, Titus 1, okay, uh, is of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth in hope of eternal life, which God, listen, who never lies, promised before the ages began. I don't know how you get that. And last but finally, a humble life. Uh, excuse me, a holy life. There's always been those, you teach eternal security, you teach your secure in Christ, the Father, Son, and Spirit has you secure. People are going to go out and live any way they want. Antinomianism, anti-against, nomos law. They're going to do what they want, when they want, whenever they want. You can't teach that from the pulpit. I'll answer with Paul. Should I sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? No one holds to the proper understanding of eternal security, believes that when you become a genuine child of God, adopted into his family, you have an attitude, oh, go do as you want. If you do, you're kidding yourself. Okay, you're kidding yourself. True salvation brings with it a hatred of sin, even in your own life. A deep recognition of our unworthiness before God, stirring a holiness, and the assurance of our acceptance before him is on Jesus and Jesus alone, responding in a life that is changing, that is alive, that is growing. Ephesians 1 talks a lot about election and predestination. We'll get to that. But you know what else he says? He says, even as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world, oh, that's great. I love election. I love that doctrine, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. A young girl was coming on to uh, be a member of the church, and one of the elders, not here, but one of the elders said to her, you know, were you a sinner before you received the Lord Jesus into your life? She said, yes, I am, I was. And I'll tell you the truth, I feel I'm, I'm a greater sinner now. And the elder said to her, you know, and what real change have you experienced? She said, I, I don't quite know how to explain it, she said, but I used to be a sinner running after sin, but now I'm a Christian, I'm a sinner running from sin. Running from sin. As the band comes up, just give me one more minute, okay? I know you've been, you've been great, but let me just say one more thing. As the band comes up, we prepare for communion. There was a, a group of botanists that were uh, searching, I believe it was in the Alps as well, uh, you know, botanists, study of plant life, and they found and they saw uh, this flower in the bottom of this ravine, and they couldn't get to it. So, so they, they saw a local kid that was nearby, and they said, listen, come here, kid. 
We're going to lower you down, these four guys. We're going to lower you down into the ravine. We got the rope. I want you to get that flower for us. It's a rare flower. We want you to get it. And the kid thought, looked, thought, looked, and said, you know what, I'll be right back. And he left. He comes back with an elderly man. He says, okay, I'm ready for the rope to go down, but I want that man, the older man that he was with, to be the last man on the rope. He's my dad. That kind of sums it up. That kind of sums it up. Who's got you? Maybe you're here today and you are playing Christianity. And you need to repent. You need to say, you know what, I don't have any, I don't have any assurance of my salvation because I'm not really taking this thing seriously. I don't want you to have assurance. Maybe you need to settle in your life right now, in your heart right now as we take communion, that he died, bread was broken, the bread is broken, his body, the cup was poured out, it was his blood, he shed on the cross for your sins, that you need to repent from living your life the way you want to live it, being your own Lord, your own Savior, your own God, and turn from your sins and trust Jesus. Love him, treasure him, worship him, and trust him for what he's done for you on the cross, solely by grace and mercy. Maybe today's the day. And then you will grow in your knowledge and love of Jesus, and the assurance of salvation will come. I don't think it's right to have somebody raise their hand and just give them all these verses of assurance. We don't know. Not that what you do makes you secure, but what you do shows whether it's genuine or not. That's all I'm saying. But maybe you're a Christian here today and you've just been battling with that. And you need to settle it right now. You know what? God's got me. And I need to respond in worship and love and obedience to him because of all his grace and mercy that he's shown to me on the cross. It's not my work. It's not my moral, uh, moralness. It's not anything I've done. It's all what Jesus has done. And you need to settle it right here. This, this communion table represents the Father, Son, and the Spirit in some ways of what has happened for you, done for you, for your salvation. The Father sent the Son. The Father, Son has sent the Spirit. And the Spirit convicts us of our sin, regenerates our heart, and makes us new creations in him. So come to the table. The band's going to play. We're going to confess our sins. We're going to repent of our sins as a church, as a body, because we'll, everyone needs to repent, including me. And then we're going to respond. So if today's your first day, respond. If you're not a Christian, you want to sit back and you just want to, you know, pray and meditate and think on these things, we'd love to meet with you after. The table's not for you. It's, it's, it's a family thing. But we love you. We're glad you're here. We want to continue talking with you. We want you to keep coming out. But I'm told in Scripture that I, I, I should let you know that the table is for those who love Jesus, who trust Jesus. So if today's your first day, come. If you're a Christian, come. We'll repent of sin, and then we'll celebrate the work of Jesus. Father, thank you for the omnipotent power that you have guarded that in which you promise. Our inheritance is, is that um, which has been kept by you so that we have the assurance that when the time comes and we leave and we close our eyes, we breathe our last, we'll be in your presence. Not by our work, not by even our fruit, Lord, but by the work of Jesus Christ alone. And we pray, Father, that as your people, we respond in a way that brings you glory, that shows forth your love and care for us in the gospel. And that the gospel of Jesus Christ would be the only thing we cling to, and that is Jesus. We pray, Father, as we repent and respond, Lord, we would do it with, with, with brokenness and, and, and repentance, but also joy and celebration, both humble and confident in all that you have done for us in our salvation. Father, Son, and Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.